You can't make this stuff up. The case of Jones versus Hernandez Trevino rolls out like a red carpet of drama. Miss Jones and Miss Hernandez are both pointing fingers at Mr. Trevino, claiming he's the VIP guest in the fatherhood saga of their children. This juicy opener lays down the drama we're about to dive into, setting up a clash of titans that feels more like a daytime TV special than real life. And just when you're grabbing your popcorn, thinking you figured it out, the plot thickens like grandma's gravy. Miss Jones and Miss Hernandez, you are each here today to, to a man that he is the father of your children. Yes. Now that man, Mr. Trevino, is waiting outside of the courtroom and will join us shortly. Who knew paternity could be as complex as a high school relationship? Miss Jones spills the tea on how Mr. Trevino's been playing hot potato with the title of dad to her daughter, flipping between yes and no faster than a politician's promises. This bit of gossip not only serves the drama, but paints a vivid picture of the emotional roller coaster everyone's riding. Buckle up, folks. This soap opera is just getting started. Miss Jones, tell me about how he's denying your daughter. He's denied her back and forth. He says, I'm not the father, I, I am I'm the father. I'm not denying, I'm simply requesting the truth, y'all. I'm not denying anybody and I've been there for both. My you family have, and I have done a lot. Word, your family, you are the father. Remember that, you have not been there. Hold on, plot twist incoming. Mr. Trevino throws in his two cents, questioning the timing of his supposed fatherhood, like he's solving a math problem without a calculator. His doubts and the mystery of timing add layers to this drama casserole, leaving us questioning everything we thought we knew. What's next? An alien abduction theory? Stay tuned. Mr. Trevino, why the doubt? Why have you been denying that this child is yours? You know, we went to the doctor. I asked him around what time did she pregnant? He gave you, me around. You don't even know what you know, time, because you're not right. Time, she nothing. You don't even know what time it is now. So let me tell you. So he Hold does on. not know. Mr. Trevino, you have an issue with the days of conception, and yes, you Honor. submitted these days to the court yes, Your Honor, to outline <laughs> your doubt. And then, because why not, things get spicy. In a moment of spicy revelation, Miss Jones admits she told Mr. Trevino he wasn't the father, purely out of spite. Talk about stirring the pot. This confession adds a pinch of chaos to the mix, revealing the tangled web of emotions and lies we're dealing with. Grab your detective hats. This mystery just added another layer. So it's a your charmer. contention that he, you were intimate with him during that time, the estimated dates of conception? I'm gonna be honest. I don't remember nothing because he's a charmer. I was intimate when he oh, wanted. Oh, don't remember. When he wanted to be intimate. I don't keep track of when I was intimate with you because you probably keep track of all the women. No. It seemed like like something it's not. So, you, I'm not, did I'm just, you always tell him that he was Cheryl's father, though? Always. Just when you thought this couldn't morph into a bigger telenovela, we dive into the possibility of other men being part of this convoluted love story. Miss Jones and Mr. Trevino are both throwing suspicions around like confetti at a wedding, suggesting there might be more content for the title of daddy. Prepare yourselves. We're about to open a whole new can of worms. Well, the truth is that she admitted that when she said it, it felt great. Her doubts and centers around I don't around care the... how mad you are. You don't tell a man that you he don't, is not the and daddy. and I agree. Especially when he's a daddy. I agree. Perfect condition, because you work. How many kids do you have? Working? Look, I, listen, we're here about one thing. Exactly. We're here about sharing. Crank up the drama dial, Mr. Trevino, not to be outdone in the suspicion stakes. Hints that Miss Hernandez might have been playing musical chairs with her affections. The shadow of doubt he casts, coupled with the debate over over the child's appearance, cranks up the drama to soap opera levels. You'll need to sit down for this next part. Uh, it's a doozy. Yes, there's this one that he's hes kind of a light-skinned guy, kind of my skin color, you know, kind no, of hairy, beardy, close. you know, hairy guy. And my son has a little bit on his back. And I don't have any hair back, on my chest. I'm, I barely have any hair on me besides my face and my, you know. Right, so. so that questions me right away. So. Mic drop moment coming right up. The DNA results are in, and guess what? Two-year-old Cheryl Trevino Jones. Mr. Trevino, you are her father. In an episode straight out of a soap opera, Ms. France spills the beans on her father's deathbed confession, revealing a bombshell. He was the biological dad of a certain Sonia, who everyone thought was Ms. Lee. The room goes silent, jaws drop, and a family tree gets more branches than anyone bargained for. And just when you think you're watching a rerun, the plot thickens, and a new twist looms on the horizon, promising to flip the script yet again. You're here along with your brother, who's waiting outside of our courtroom. You say your father claimed on his deathbed that he was the biological father of a child named Sonia. Yes, Your Honor. If indeed you've now found the correct Sonia, you believe the plaintiff, Ms. Lee, is your sister. Yes, Your Honor. Buckle up for this emotional whirlwind as Ms. Lee unpacks the shock and awe of finding out her dad might not be her dad after all. Imagine living your whole life as a sequel only to find out you're actually in a spinoff. She navigates this identity crisis with the grace of a cat on a hot tin roof, teetering on the edge of a dramatic revelation. Strap in because we're diving headfirst 
immersed into a family saga that makes Shakespeare look like child's play. From the beginning of this, this has been real confusing and overwhelming for me, mainly because I only knew one man to be my father my whole life until he died. I was a daddy's baby, and with me and my father was very close. I never heard of Mrs. Francis' father until um, I was 38 years old. So it's been real hard for me. Well, for it's hard for me to be years. here even questioning my paternity, you know, because I loved my dad so much and he loved me. Mrs. France takes us down memory lane, revealing she always suspected she had a long-lost twin frolicking in the fields of Michigan. Their tales are so intertwined, it's like they shared a scriptwriter, with their kids accidentally becoming BFFs and a series of missed connections worthy of a romantic comedy. But wait, there's more. The rabbit hole of familial discovery is just getting started, and it's deep than we thought. The whole time I was growing up, I heard Mrs. Lee, and I was always told that I had a twin in Michigan the whole time. We went to the same school, we know the same people, we never even met. Our kids are even best friends and never even knew they really? were cousins. Yes. I even know her grandmother, and her grandmother and my grandmother are best friends, and I still never met Mrs. Lee. The plot thickens as Ms. Davis embarks on a mission impossible to find her sister Sonia, following their father's last wish. The quest unravels a twist nobody saw coming. Sonia, long believed to be a ghost, is very much alive. This revelation sets off a domino effect, unearthing secrets buried under years of family lore. Grab your popcorn, because what comes next is a roller coaster of emotions, revelations, and the kind of family drama that could win an Oscar. Well, I started on Facebook, and I couldn't find her on Facebook nowhere. So and I you were looking at the name. Gave up the search looking for Sonya Miller. Sonya Miller. We, we thought she was Sonya Miller, but I couldn't find her at all and wanted us to find her. I wasn't going to stop my search. I was going to keep on searching. Getting on Facebook again after he passed away led us to put her in obituary as deceased, and she was not deceased. As we peel away the layers of this intricate family onion, Ms. Lee confronts the whirlwind of emotions tied to the revelations about her paternity. She navigates the maze of what-ifs, mourning the lost time, with siblings she never knew she had, all while dealing with the existential crisis of a lifetime. The stage is set for an emotional showdown with a surprise guest appearance that promises to bring tears, laughter, and maybe a group hug. So you had doubts? Doubts? I, I rejected it, period. <laughs> I just rejected it because it didn't make sense to me. When I first called, my mom was like, you know, somebody just contacted me. What does this mean? Who is Mr. Miller? First, she just rejected me. She was like, ain't no sister talking about that. You know, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. She did not deny, wouldn't, wouldn't even discuss it with me at first. In a suspense-filled courtroom scene, Mr. Miller makes a grand entrance, claiming a familial bond with Ms. Lee that feels ripped from a feel-good movie. The tension is palpable, the crowd is on the edge of their seats, and the background music swells. But hold your horses, this emotional roller coaster has a few more loops to go, and the next revelation is a heart warmer that could melt even the coldest of hearts. I've never Aww. met him. And you've never, ever <laughs> laid eyes on him. Mm -mm. Jerome, him. will you please escort Mr. Miller into the courtroom? Good afternoon, Your Honor. Hello, Mr. Miller. Hello. Thank you for joining us today. If it's okay with you and Ms. Lee, could I give her a hug? Oh. This is my first time seeing you. That'd be okay. As the curtain rises on the final act, the DNA results are in, and the verdict is more heartwarming than a puppy video. The France Miller as to whether Sonia Lee is related to Ronald Miller and Rachel France and thus is the biological daughter of the late Ronald Miller. Ms. Lee, they are indeed your <laughs> biological <laughs> brother and sister. <laughs> Buckle up, Buttercup, because you're not going to believe this circus. The roller coaster case of Jones versus Hernandez, Trevino, kicks off. The courtroom drama unfolds, with Miss Jones and Miss Hernandez both adamant that Mr. Trevino is the star of their parental dramas. Each lady is on a mission to slap a paternity label on Trevino to secure their kids a daddy on record. Brace yourselves. The drama llama is just getting warmed up. Hello, Your Honor. This is the case of Jones versus Hernandez. Trevino. Thank you, Jerome. Good day, everyone. Ms. Jones and Ms. Hernandez, you are each here today to prove to a man that he is the father of your children. Is this real life or is this just fantasy? Judge Lake dives into the soap opera, spotlighting Mr. Trevino's predicament caught between two fiery women staking their claims. The air crackles with anticipation as the judge decides to throw Mr. Trevino into the mix pronto, lighting the fuse for what promises to be an epic showdown. Popcorn's ready. This is about to get juicier than a reality TV finale. Ms. Jones say Mr. Trevino is denying your child and you say it has a lot to do with Ms. Hernandez. Now, Ms. Hernandez, you say he's also 
denying he's the father of your child. Jerome, I'm ready to see Mr. Trevino right now. Grab your popcorn, folks. A verbal wildfire erupts between Miss Jones and Mr. Trevino over the daddy drama involving Miss Jones's offspring, Cheryl. Miss Jones slings accusations of denial and flip-flopping at Trevino while he's all about seeking the bald truth. This clash is more than a telenovela's worth of emotion and personal stakes. Strap in. We're cranking up the intensity. He's denied her back and forth. I'm not the father. I am I'm the father. I'm not denying. I'm simply requesting the truth, y'all. I'm not denying anybody, and I've been there for both of you. Your family, you are the father. Remember that. You have not been. So, I ha so you're saying Ms. I haven't Jones, helped you? though, you're claiming he's denying paternity. He has. You couldn't make this stuff up if you tried. The saga between Miss Jones and Mr. Trevino thickens, spilling tea about past squabbles and blame games that have tossed them into this paternity pickle. Miss Jones confesses to spitefully benching Trevino from the father role during a spat, a move she's now biting her nails over and you thought your family reunions were awkward. I get that you hurt, but you did choose to be with him, so it had to be something about him you like. I did. I did. I was in love with him, and I did feel that he was a good person. So He's it's a your charmer. contention that you were intimate with him during that time, the estimated dates of conception? I don't remember nothing because he's a charmer. I was always intimate when he oh, wanted... Oh, now you don't remember. ...when he wanted to be intimate. Hold on to your hats for this hairpin turn. Now it's Miss Hernandez's time to shine, throwing another curveball into the paternity plot. She lays out the messy web of tensions and personal drama, entangling Mr. Trevino's potential daddy duties. Miss Hernandez swears she's not trying to stir the pot in Mr. Trevino's daddy-daughter dance with Miss Jones's kiddo. But oh, the drama begs to differ. Dive deeper and the rabbit hole goes wild. She hinders a lot of the things. I can't come see Cheryl, our daughter. Miss Hernandez doesn't want me to be around my daughter. What is your response to her claim that what you are it? interfering with his ability to be a father to his child that he has with her? I'm not interfering in him being a father. I am interfering in him being in a relationship with her. I she does no not. You don't need to be. Him. Yes, you are. If I'm you in a relationship with anything to do with him, I had him. Really? Let him That's go. A so then why can't, why, can't you, why can't you have him be alone with his daughter? Just when you thought it was safe to go back in the courtroom, we pivot to the daddy debate over Miss Hernandez's mini-me. Mr. Trevino is swimming in a sea of doubts, fueled by his side-eye at Miss Hernandez's antics and the kids' looks that just don't add up. This chapter peels back layers of personal uncertainty and the quest for daddyhood truth. But wait, there's more drama on the horizon that that'll knock your socks off. With my son, there's been so many times where I'm going off to work and she's over here straightening her hair and putting on makeup. Why don't you do that while I'm there? You should be doing that for me. Not when I'm on my way to work. No, Guy's coming over no. and when I'm getting home from they're work, they're leaving. They're coming over for my brothers, not coming over you know for I mean? me. Like, I can't and her brothers, that. by the way, her brothers hate me. But she has brothers and they have friends. You can cut the tension with a knife. An explosive argument detonates, laying bare the emotional wreckage these paternity squabbles have left in their wake. Accusations and feelings collide like bumper cars. With everyone's eyes on the prize, a clear future for the kiddos involved. Gear up for a game-changing bombshell that could flip the script. Why would he be there when there was a possibility because that... Because it felt good. I'm not talking what to you right now. I'm you talking can, to the judge. You cannot, so, you cannot so blame me. She told me with your mouth, she's not mine. And that then you started naming me Julio years, and I don't know who good, else. But if you didn't think I supported you after you stayed All right, let's, get some, order. Order. let's get some order. Let's get some order. The build-up to this moment has been nothing short of epic. Judge Lake takes Miss Jones to task for tossing gasoline on the fire by spitefully denying Mr. Trevino's fatherhood. This facepalm-worthy moment shines a spotlight on the weight of responsibility and the ripple effects of our choices on the little ones caught in the crossfire. The climax is on the horizon, and it's gearing up to be a doozy. Because you way up high on your horse over there. And yet, what you're not willing to do is accept the fact that your actions have a consequence. Now, when you get so angry at a man because he's not doing what you want him to do or what you need him to do and you decide the way you hurt me and I'm going to tell you that this child isn't yours, you then can't stand up here or be the victim because he then starts to act like the child isn't his. Here it is, the moment of truth. Everyone's been holding their breath for. The grand finale hits with the DNA test results dropping like a mic at a rap battle. In the case of Jones versus Hernandez Trevino, as it pertains to two-year-old Cheryl Trevino Jones, Mr. Trevino, you are her father. The roller coaster ride of Kid versus Rawlings kicks off with Mr. Kid jumping into the fray, claiming Ms. Rawlings pulled the wool over his eyes by making him think he was the MVP in the fatherhood league for her son, Nathan. But plot twist, she allegedly backpedals when a supposedly upgrade dude enters the scene. This bombshell accusation throws us headfirst into the drama and sets up a saga filled with emotional twists, turns, and jaw-dropping moments. And trust me, just when you think you've seen every trick in the book, the next act flips the script. Mr. Kid, you say Ms. Rawlings is a manipulator 
manipulative user who convinced you that you were the father of her son, Nathaniel, then changed her mind when someone better came along. You and your mother say Miss Rawlings' mind games have wreaked emotional havoc on your family, and you are 100% positive you are her son's father. Strap in for this whirlwind. Mr. Kid, wearing his heart on his sleeve, dives deep into his tale of paternity pride turned paternity puzzle. He reminisces about the days when Ms. Rawlings had him convinced he was Nathaniel's numero uno daddio, complete with love letters and shared dreams, all while he was out conquering the world. This heartfelt narrative against the backdrop of Ms. Rawlings' later just kidding stance paints a Shakespearean landscape of love, betrayal, and diaper duties. But hold on to your popcorn, because this emotional roller coaster has more loops. Why are you so convinced you are Nathaniel's father? Well, Your Honor, when this first started off, she um, she came to me and told me that he was mine. Um, they sent me, she was sending me letters when I was uh, gone. And so you were away when she found out she was pregnant? I was away about a month after. I went away after, a month after she found out she was pregnant. And did you tell him it was his child, Ms. Rawlings? No, Your Honor. You're not ready for this bombshell. Enter Ms. Rawlings with a plot twist that could rival any daytime soap opera. She lays down the complicated web of Nathaniel's paternity saga, weaving a tale of romance, mystery, and a who's the daddy dilemma, with Mr. Kid and a mysterious other contender in the mix. Her story adds more layers than a wedding cake to the drama, cranking up the emotional dial and leaving everyone guessing. Brace yourselves. The next revelation will have your eyebrows reaching new heights. What was your relationship with this man like? We were in a serious relationship. I was actually at some point, once I left from being around Mr. Kid, that I was actually staying with him. So how often were you with Mr. Kid and how often were you with the other guy? Pretty much going back and forth because I was staying with him and I was leaving from being with Mr. Kid to going with him and coming back to Mr. Kid. The drama intensifies with a side of sweetness. In a scene straight out of a feel-good movie, Mince Jenkins, Mr. Kid's mom, shares a tearjerker of a story about her first enchanting encounter with Nathaniel at a park. She describes it as if the clouds parted and the sun shone just for them, marking it as a top-tier moment in her life. This touching interlude reminds us of the power of love and connection beyond DNA, serving as a warm hug in the midst of the chaos. But don't get too cozy. The next curveball will have you picking your jaw up off the floor. We were at a park. He was in a car, or a stroller, and I said hey to her. I said, but you know, I would I'm here for and I went straight to the baby picked him up had said hey sugarfoot and he smiled and we played and honestly the best day of my life I'm holding my grandson I know it's mine and I have pictures I'd like to see those of both my babies and when you look at these pictures what do you see my son your son on the left and that's Nathaniel on the right just when you think we've reached peak drama, the plot thickens as Ms. Rawlings drops another bomb, revealing yet another contender in the Nathaniel Daddy Derby who's also spotting familial features in the kiddo. This twist throws another spicy meatball into the already simmering sauce of the paternity mystery, turning up the heat on the emotional stove and stirring the pot like never before. And just when you're trying to catch your breath, the next clue will have you gasping for air. And as I sent her picture, she's like, yes, I believe it's Kevin. It's Kevin's. It's gotta be. Ms. Rawlings, did the other guy, the other potential father, did did he ever acknowledge that he could be the father or express interest in being in Nathaniel's life? Yes, he did, because he was the one that actually told me to get a test to see if I was pregnant. And me and him were sick together. And he actually reached back out to me because he had some other situations going on, looking at pictures, and he questioned it again. He was like, are you sure the other guy is your child's father? Your mind is about to be blown. The courtroom becomes the arena for the ultimate revelation. It has been determined by this court, Mr. Kidd, you are the father. <laughs> you are the father. Thank you. Thank you. All right, imagine the craziest, most out there TV drama, then crank it up a notch. We've got Crow versus Reinhardt in a showdown that feels like it's straight out of a reality TV script. Crow is on a mission, dragging Reinhardt to court with a big claim. Her late son is the dad of her super cute kiddo, Thomas. She's all about proving paternity, while Reinhardt seems to think Crow is just drama central, hunting for cash under the guise of connecting Thomas with his dad. And that's just the opening act. Miss Crow, you have summoned the defendant to court to prove that her deceased son, J.C. Turner, father your two-year-old son, Thomas. You want Thomas to know who his father is, and you say that Ms. Reinhardt has done everything she can to sabotage your efforts. But wait, it gets spicier. Reinhardt claps back, painting Crow as the queen of tricks, totally denying any chance that her son could be Thomas's dad. She's convinced Crow is on a gold-digging expedition, aiming for those sweet, sweet death benefits. The tension? It's just starting to bubble. Trying to claim him as her son's father, only to get death benefits.
benefits. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Miss Crow, are you doing this just for the money? It is more than just the money. I would like help with my son, yes, of course, but my son cannot grow up and meet his father. So he deserves that right to know who his father is. Then Crow, heart on her sleeve, shares how she's been trying to keep her son's dad's memory alive, making baby Thomas listen to his voice over the phone. It's like one of those moments in movies that make you reach for a box of tissues, except it's real life and there's no background music. And I would put him on speakerphone so his son could hear his voice. Okay. And so, Ms. Reinhardt, you don't believe your son is Miss Crow's child's biological father? No. Explain. For several reasons. In the time period, the time frame she said she was, when she told me she was pregnant, it didn't happen that way. The drama escalates faster than a rocket, with Reinhardt throwing out wild suspicions about Thomas not being her grandson because of, get this, earlobe shapes and birth timing. She's all about trusting her mom instincts over what the scientists say. It's like we're in a soap opera, but with more earlobe discussions. All right, continue. Uh, looking at that picture, I understand. My son and I had a very tight relationship, and Jay would tell me everything when nobody else was around. I knew my son inside and out, and I, ju I, I just don't, as a mother, as a grandmother, having four babies of my own, my gut tells me this is not my grandson. Crow takes us down memory lane, recounting the whirlwind romance with Jay, Thomas's supposed dad. It's a story full of passion, quick decisions, and a heartfelt acceptance of Thomas. It's like watching a romance novel unfold, but with more arguments and legal battles. Had a conversation. From that conversation, we ended up walking to the store. We had a, became inseparable. We, you know, developed, you know, feelings, and it did happen all too fast. He did ask me to be his girlfriend, and we did have unprotected sex as well. There's no doubt in my mind that Jay's the father. I did not sleep with anybody else in that time. There's, to me, there's no other option. Just when you think you've got a handle on things, the plot thickens. We learn about Jay's battles with his mind, his schizophrenia, and how it led him to see the world in a unique way. Reinhardt waves the flag of doubt, suggesting Jay's judgment was as clear as mud. Crow, standing strong, paints a picture of a love story that's more twisty than a mountain road. And my son, I didn't leave him because of that. Mom. And she could have told him that that was that's his baby. So he you're saying he, he really did not have the discernment to even say, I I don't believe that's my baby. No, I've had eight grandkids and all eight of my grandkids favor me. I've got a baby picture. If you and if I take that baby picture, I could put it up against my daughter. I could even put it up against my 18-year-old granddaughter. And we all look like quadruplets. I have strong genes. Crow shares the emotional roller coaster of deciding to part ways with Jay for her and her children's well being. This tale adds a new layer of complexity, showing Crow as a warrior mom on a quest for peace in a storm of drama. It's like an epic saga, but with more legal paperwork and emotional speeches. She told me no. I said, You didn't take pregnancy. How do you know you're pregnant? I know my body. Well, I know first what it of all, like. your hormone levels feel have my... to build up to even pass a pregnant test. Ooh, did you just learn this? No, I've been knew this. The, the truth will set you free. You know, maybe you'll <laughs> learn if you actually tell the truth. And so you felt like she was being so descriptive that she was really already pregnant. Yes, ma'am. I, like I said, I've had four kids. Then a bombshell drops. Crow was the bearer of the sad news of Jay's passing to Reinhardt, highlighting the deep rift and lack of communication between their families. This twist adds a sense of isolation and struggle to Crow's quest for a connection, making the drama even more intense. At the time we were living together, it was March 2015. I have decided to no longer go any further in the relationship because I have two other kids. I'm pregnant and he's a grown man. He's doing what he wants to do and I can't stop him. He comes home one night and and he's drunk, he left the door wide open, we don't live in the best neighborhood. That was the last straw. I didn't want nothing bad to happen to me, or my children, or him in my care. The climax builds with the anticipation of DNA results in the courtroom, and boom. The percentage of relatedness between Ms. Reinhardt and Thomas Crow is 99.6% you are related. <laughs> that is your grandchild. The air was thick with suspense. Ms. Hall throws the gauntlet down, accusing Mr. Richards of dodging his fatherly duties to their newborn, Demaney, and not contributing a dime to diaper changes. Mr. Richards fires back with a zinger, suggesting Ms. Hall's accusations stem from an unquenchable desire for him, labeling her as desperately thirsty for more than just a sip of his attention. Buckle up, because this roller coaster is just leaving the station. Ms. Hall, you and your mother are furious with the defendant because he denies your one-month-old son, Demani, and does nothing to support him. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Richards, you believe that Ms. Hall is claiming you are the father because she wants to be with you. 
Raising the stakes to sky-high levels, the courtroom gasps and murmurs as the drama escalates like a soap opera season finale. At the heart of the squabble is Mr. Richards' steadfast denial of his son, and his insinuation that Ms. Hall's pursuit of him was nothing more than a wild goose chase fueled by loneliness. The grandmother jumps into the fray, guns blazing, stressing the importance of a paternity test for the sake of the little one's future. Strap in, because the plot is about to thicken like oatmeal left on the stove. We just made a mistake and messed with somebody and got a baby, and now we're trying to see if my grandson let him know that he's the dad. Mr. Richard? Yes, Your Honor. You haven't done anything for the child at all? No, Admitted? Ma no, ma'am. And that's because you sincerely doubt paternity? Yes. He's not gonna do nothing. What's the nature of this relationship? Tell me, what, what's, what was going on here? Digging deeper, we uncover a saga. The twisted tale of Ms. Hall and Mr. Richards unfolds, showcasing a history dotted with makeups and breakups that would give any telenovela a run for its money. Mr. Richards confesses to hitting up Ms. Hall with the charm of a Casanova, but with the intention of keeping things as casual as Netflix browsing. He acknowledges his flirtations were driven by an insatiable thirst. What's around the corner is as unexpected as finding a llama at a petting zoo. It wasn't just like I broke her heart in 2013. It broke both of our heart. I guess you could say that. I felt like maybe I was wrong for the way I ended things last time, so I gave and her another again. chance. So how did you reach out to her? Instagram DM, told her, hey, she replied, and it went from there. So how is she thirsty if he hit her up? The thirst is going both ways, ma'am. I would admit How's I was being thirsty also. Thirsty. Okay, hold on. In a jaw-dropping twist, Ms. Hall spills the tea about her pregnancy discovery saga and the Herculean task of breaking the news to Mr. Richards, given their rocky past. Mr. Richards, ever the skeptic, casts doubt on his fatherhood, suggesting Ms. Hall's social calendar with other gentlemen as the source of his suspicion. Brace yourselves, because we're about to dive into the deep end of revelations. So you were extra thirsty. A little bit. Because you reached out to her and was manipulating the situation to bring her back into the pic because you just wanted to what, date her again? Because you said to me you did it because you thought the last time it didn't really end right. No, you told me that. So don't tell me what I you mean, think she want to hear. Tell me the truth. I mean, that's the truth. Did you reach back out to her because you felt like you wanted to rekindle the relationship because you thought it went wrong for the time being? For the time being, Your Honor. <gasps> As the accusations soar like eagles, the plot thickens with Mr. Richards doubling down on his paternity skepticism, scrutinizing Ms. Hall's past rendezvous with the precision of a detective. Despite Ms. Hall's insistence on her fidelity, Mr. Richards stands firm, his feet planted in a mud of doubt, demanding DNA proof before stepping into the dad shoes. But wait, there's more. You're about to be gobsmacked. He came to spend time with her for her birthday and stayed a week. Then when he left, it was, oh, I don't want you no more and talking crap. So you went to stay with her for a week, Mr. Richards? and then after that, you basically broke up with her again? No, Your Honor, I think I was there for no longer than four days. I didn't just leave and break up with her. The courtroom's anticipation is at a fever pitch, and it holds its collective breath as the DNA test is revealed. So I'm like, whoa, I didn't say anything, and I probably spent the rest of that day on the couch till the bus came. On the bus, soon as I got on the bus, officially on the bus, I sent the message. Like, I seen the messages in your phone, but I seen the guy across the street, and that's where it ended. I told her to block my number. Give you the right to take her phone look in it and then be angry if somebody was texting her. Well, it sounds like you went there to play her and then you got played and then you didn't... Or, 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 I was looking for a reason not to talk to her anymore. Right from the get-go, the air was charged with a mix of suspense and a hint of massive drama as Mr. Barlow opens the Pandora's box of doubt. He's pretty convinced he's not the father of Ms. Winslow's kiddo, Jabril. Why, you ask? Well, Jabril's got curls that defy gravity and Mr. Barlow's hair is as straight as a ruler. Plus, Mr. Barlow throws in a zinger about possibly not being the only one warming Ms. Winslow's heart, hinting at a spicy liaison with the landlord. Talk about a soap opera plot twist. Mr. Barlow, you say your eight kids look exactly like you, but the defendant's son, Jabril, looks nothing like you. And that's because you're not his father. And you know who is. Am I correct? Yes, Your Honor. Ms. Winslow, you stand in court stating that Mr. Barlow is your son's biological father, but also say if he's not, there's a good reason for it. That's correct. In a plot twist worthy of a primetime drama, Mr. Barlow throws down the gauntlet, accusing Ms. Winslow of a scandalous rendezvous with the landlord while he was off on a business trip. The audience gasps, clutching their pearls. This isn't just a paternity question. It's an episode of who's been sleeping in my bed. The tension is thicker than the plot of a mystery novel. You understand? As I was away, I believe she was sleeping with the landlord. You do? Yeah. And, and that's not possible, and Your Honor. The landlord... Why do you believe that? What evidence do you have? Did you hear something? No. Nah, as something? I was away, I would call all the time because I, I got a long past of infidelity. A very and long so, history. And so so I left. When I went away, she said, pay back some. Stated that, Your Honor. So he come 
now, up with I me. go away. I've never seen that. And while I'm away, I'm calling and stuff. The plot thickens like a good stew with whispers about the landlord's nocturnal escapades supposedly to fix a leaky faucet or a squeaky door. Mr. Barlow's suspicion meter is off the charts, considering these handyman visits more personal than professional. It's a classic case of handyman or homewrecker as the audience waits with bated breath. I'm calling at 10 p.m. Oh, and he did. You call at 10 and, and he's there. Yeah, the he land, no, the landlord at the house at 10 p.m. Yeah, and you know why you're beds and stuff. You know why you're Put together the beds? Yeah. You know why I'm you're like, how how he Because he doesn't have contractors. He he does things. So what his so-called girlfriend story about building this. himself. So if he has to come at ten o'clock at night to fix some water that's leaking from my roof for three children in my house, then that's what he's gonna do. Just when you thought we were in the clear, Ms. Winslow drops a bombshell that could rival any season finale cliffhanger. She fears Jabril might actually belong to another family, sparking a switcheroo at the hospital. The plot not only thickens, but practically congeals at this point, adding a layer of intrigue to the already muddled paternity mystery. What I went to do is get my lights cut on, and they told me that the place that I was trying to rent wasn't even rentable. Therefore, I'm driving around in a U-Haul with no place to go. I come across a landlord, okay. and I tell him I have no money. I gave my $2,000 to a landlord that so was crooked and I can't furniture. even move in ask the house. Okay, well, since you don't have anything right now and I see you with your three children in a U-Haul truck, you can move in without giving me anything. And when you get the deposit back from the previous landlord, then you can start paying me. Grab your tissues because Ms. Winslow's breakdown is next level. She's not just shedding tears, she's launching a full-blown emotional tsunami, fearing the son she's been Snapchatting baby pics of might not be hers. It's a heart-to-heart -heart moment that makes the audience reach for their comfort snacks as the emotional stakes skyrocket. Over, no exaggeration, over 80 times I call, and I'm like, yo, what's up, babe? Hey, I can't talk right now. Click, and so I call right back. You know what? Hey, yo, you know what? We can't talk right now. Hey, yo, hey, yo, I got the landlord here. It's it over I, 80 times. Over 80 the, times. Just hung up Yeah, on. hang up on me. He when I came home one time, I pop up. To hold I pop up. He I pop. calls to try to see if he can hear noise in the background. I'm at home with three boys. You could hear a pin drop in the courtroom as the judge announces Ms. Winslow is indeed Jabril's biological mom. It's a victory lap for motherhood, sprinkled with a dash of daytime drama resolution. But don't switch channels yet. This roller coaster has a few more loops. Carlo, you say you feel like the baby doesn't look like you. Man, he look like this dude. Only reason I can't tell you that they got the same hair color because he bald head. The atmosphere is buzzing with the electric charge of a season finale as the truth bomb drops. You're the child's mother because everywhere you go, people are asking you. Everywhere I go. And everywhere I go. It's like, it's so unfair because they treat me like I'm a kidnapper. It's, it's really not funny. It's not a joke. I'm going to take a moment. I want to look through my paperwork and make sure I have some answers before we go any further. Do you understand? Yes. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Barla, you are the father. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Holthouse is in real trouble, torn between the father of her child being either a blast from her romantic past or plot twist, her mother's current flame, Mr. Shinuald. The crowd's jaws drop as the tangled web of relationships begins to unravel. Brace yourselves. We're diving deeper into the rabbit hole. Yes, Your Honor. Shockingly, you confess it's either a man you shared a sexual relationship with who wants nothing to do with your child or the defendant who happens to be your mother's boyfriend. <laughs> Now, Mr. Chenault, you are Ms. Holdhouse's mother's boyfriend. Yes, Your Honor. You're not ready for how this roller coaster started. Mr. Shinuald, with a tale that sounds like a comedy of errors, spills the beans on the inception of his steamy yet ill-advised affair with Ms. Holthouse. It all began with a text message so wrong and so typo-ridden, it should have been auto-corrected out of existence, spiraling into a whirlwind of lust and bad decisions. Strap in, because this ride takes a wilder turn just ahead. So, Mr. Chenault, how did you end up in a sexual relationship with your girlfriend's daughter. It started out as a text message, Your Honor. I received what wasn't supposed to come to me and a word was misspelled. It was a word. A few days later, she had on clothing, you know, a little skirt, breast out. And next thing you know, one thing led to another. We started flirting with each other back and forth. Things just escalated from there. You, wait a minute. Did you ever think in your mind this is inappropriate? <laughs> Ms. Holthouse shares the story of how a simple, misfired text snowballed into an illicit romance with her mom's beau, climaxing in a rendezvous at a park that's probably seen less action in its entire existence. Both the judge and the audience can't believe their escapade's audacity, secrecy, and sheer movie-like quality. And just when you think you've seen it all, there's more. Did you have any thought, intention, about having a sexual relationship with your mother's boyfriend? I had not really thought about it until I got a phone call from him. And he was talking about having sex and going going somewhere. 
I snuck out of my grandma's house that night and we went to a park. And what happened at the park? We had sexual relations. Here comes a twist of rich betrayal, which could be a dessert. The undercover liaison between Ms. Holthouse and Mr. Shinwal, spanning a scandalous six months, remained a secret from Ms. Holthouse's mother until the bombshell dropped amidst an already dramatic backdrop of both Mr. Shinwal and the mom wearing orange jumpsuits. So how long did the sexual relationship last? It was about six months. Six months? Yes, yeah, sure. Did your mother have any idea this was going on? She didn't have any idea until Mr. Shinwal and her got locked up and he got out while he was in jail. How did she find out? She she had kind of manipulated both of us, saying that I told her about what we did and I never said anything, and she said that he told her about what we did and he never said anything. And who confessed? Actually, I confessed. You did? Yes, ma'am. Get your tissues ready for an emotional roller coaster. Ms. Bogardis, the heartbroken mother, into the courtroom drama. Her entrance is as dramatic as her discovery of the convoluted love triangle, or square. Her sorrow and sense of betrayal are so tangible, you could almost reach out and touch it, painting a poignant picture of the emotional wreckage left behind. What unfolds next might just tilt the scales. Did she ever almost catch you? Yes. And when she what did, happened? she she, um, she caught me standing in front of her, my pants unzipped. She was really furious and upset, and we basically got into huge arguments and fights about things that were going on. And so, when you found out you were pregnant, Miss Holthouse, did your mother know anything about this? No, Your Honor. Just when you thought we'd reached peak drama, it turns out, in a surprising twist of fate, or perhaps sheer madness, all involved parties have been corralled under one roof, living in a tense truce that's one dirty dish away from imploding. This bizarre living arrangement highlights the lengths they'll go to, keep the peace, or at least avoid more court dates, but hold on, because there's more drama on the horizon. That it could be his, maybe. You were on it. Yes, Your Honor. So, Mr. Chanel, guessing at this point, hoping she throws you out at this point. <laughs> Actually, Your Honor, no. Are you still currently in a relationship with Miss Holthouse's mother? Yes. A curveball that'll make you do a double take. In a move that raises more than a few eyebrows and probably a few blood pressures, both Ms. Holthouse and Mr. Shinwald give the lie detector test a hard pass. This refusal sends the rumor mill into overdrive, thickening the plot and the air of mystery surrounding their already dubious narrative. But nothing, and I mean nothing, can brace you for what's next. At the same time, he was in a sexual relationship with you. Yes. Did they deny it at first? Yes. But we... your intuition told you something was going on. Right, because my daughter was acting funny. What was she acting? Life. If I was sitting on the couch next to Mr. Chanel and I would get up to go to the bathroom, she would get up out of the chair across the room to sit by him. Oh, no, she didn't. The grand finale, the moment of truth, the big reveal. It has been determined by this court. You are not. Thank you, Donna. I can hear you sigh of relief, Miss Bogardis. I do think that we all need counseling. Enter the whirlwind drama of Lang versus Brown. Here we have Mr. Lang, jittery as a cat on a hot tin roof, alongside his mother, Ms. Lang, both itching to uncover the truth behind the paternity of little Janelle. Despite the swirling storm of doubts, Mr. Lang is crossing fingers and toes, hoping he's the dad. On the flip side, Ms. Brown and her mother are baffled by the Lang's anxiety, firmly believing Mr. Lang is the one and only dad contender, and they can't wrap their heads around why the Lang duo seems to be more detached than a loose tooth. The drama's just starting to simmer, folks. Mr. Lang, you and your mother Ms. Lang have been waiting in agony to find out if you're indeed the biological father of your little daughter, Janelle. Now, although you have serious doubt, Mr. Lang, you want nothing more than for this child to be yours. Yes, Your Honor. All right. And then it escalates to daytime TV levels of drama. Accusations fly and denials. On Sue, Ms. Lang, with the skepticism of a seasoned detective, throws shade at Ms. Brown, insinuating she's been cozying up not just to her son, but to Mr. Lang's supposed BFF, Mr. Dixon. But wait, there's a a twist. Ms. Brown claps back, saying, Mr. Lang and Mr. Dixon are more like oil and water, not buddies. Strap in, because the plot's about to get as twisted as a pretzel. Because I found out that Miss Brown slept with my son's best friend from the sandbox best friend. Think she know whether it's my son's or Mr. Dixon's. Oh, really? Is yeah. that true? No, Ms. that's Brown? not true, Your Honor. I've never slept with Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon and Mr. Lang have been not friends for a while. They've been going at it, trying to fight each other, trying to find each other. Just when you thought it was safe to go back into the drama. Relationship roller coaster. Ms. Brown takes us down memory lane through the tumultuous love saga with Mr. Lang filled with more twists than a soap opera. She paints a picture of a man juggling women like a circus performer with his mother playing the role of the master illusionist. Brace yourselves. We're diving deep into the emotional
emotional abyss. Wow. With so many girls, and it was in her house. She didn't lie about him. She didn't lie for him, and then I find out she's lying for him. Girl, why don't I tell you the like, truth? It's my son. Not okay, I don't knock you for that. Well, your mother lied for you, girlfriend. No, I don't have off. no reason to lie for her. Knock it off. I don't have no reason to lie. This morning, I want to understand. You were together. He was doing his cheating. Were you sleeping with anybody else? No. As well? Not no. that we know of. The plot doesn't just thicken. It practically solidifies. The big reveal. Ms. Brown recounts the tale of Mr. Lang turning into a giddy schoolboy upon hearing about the pregnancy, parading the pregnancy test around like it's a trophy. Mr. Lang stands by her through thick and thin, proving to be her rock during the pregnancy saga, despite Ms. Brown's initial reservations about becoming a mom amidst her college adventures. But just when they thought they were on cloud nine, doubt rears its ugly head. Did you have any doubts at that time? Not at that time, no, I didn't. And what made you start to have doubt? When Mr. When Mr. Dixon got in the picture, and he had told me to stop messing with her, the baby she's pregnant with could possibly be his. Oh! So Leaving she informs mail. you that she's having a baby and you're the father. Yes. Then you get a phone call from Mr. Dixon mm -hmm. and he tells you, don't be too happy because yeah. the baby's mine. Yes, ma'am. Walking to her house to her apartment while I'm like walking down the street, things like that. Yeah, pictures together, hugged up. Was this before or after the baby was born? Before. Twists and turns around every corner, doubts enter stage left. The plot thickens as Mr. Dixon whispers to Mr. Lang, suggesting a plot twist worthy of a blockbuster. Maybe he's the father? This seed of doubt sprouts into a full-grown tree of suspicion, with Mr. Lang catching glimpses of Mr. Dixon and Ms. Brown that make him question everything. The suspense is about to explode. You are in the middle of the relationship. No, I stayed out of the relationship. When they was going back and forth, I never got in it because- But she was always they, in it. I was she was that always they in would it. work it out. This thing over so here, you this is Girl, you were hoping that thing over there, that thing over there, no, this is like Listen, listen, okay, listen, stop, listen, stop, listen, 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 communication breakdowns and plot twists. Oh my, the great divide. Miscommunications and accusations about Mr. Lang's wandering eye lead to a chasm as wide as the Grand Canyon, with Ms. Brown calling out Ms. Lang for fanning the flames on social media. What happens next? You'll need to see it to believe it. So my you all were there side. and cooperating? The yes, yes, Your Honor. Your Honor. Honor. Was there. She was only there. Like, I'm just here to see if this is my baby. No, when this baby, line. hold on, I'm talking. When this grandbaby is born, I'll be able to look at it and tell. That's the only reason she was there, to see for my because once this baby comes out, I'll be able to tell if this is my grandbaby. You, you're you there, you cut the umbilical cord, you signed the birth certificate. When you looked at this baby, did you think the baby was yours? Grab your popcorn. It's the big reveal. DNA drama. The tension reaches its zenith as the DNA test results are unveiled. When it comes to one-year-old baby Janelle, Mr. Lang, you are not oh. the father. Are you serious? <laughs> okay. That's a lie. <laughs> oh that my is a God. lie. <laughs> lie. The DNA doesn't oh lie. So God, baby. Oh, baby. <laughs> oh. The show starts with Ms. Nesbitt throwing down the gauntlet, aiming to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that Mr. Henderson is the dad of her adorable, albeit quite loud, seven-month-old daughter, Zion. She's got her fingers crossed, hoping against hope that Mr. Henderson will step up to the plate after the paternity is confirmed. But oh, just when you think we're in for a simple paternity drama, the plot thickens like a stew on a cold winter's day. Ms. Nesbitt, you are suing to prove to Mr. Henderson that he is the father of your seven-month-old daughter, Zion. Yes, Your Honor. You say that when the results prove you right, you expect Mr. Henderson to step up. Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Henderson, you claim your case is simple. You say Ms. Nesbitt cheated on you with her neighbor during the window of conception, and he is Zion's biological father. Yes, Your Honor. 
hold on to your hats because just when you're convinced it couldn't possibly get more tangled than a ball of yarn after a kitten party, Mr. Henderson throws a curveball. He counters Ms. Nesbitt's claim with a blockbuster allegation. She was cozying up with her neighbor during the crucial conception window, throwing a giant shadowy question mark over Zion's paternity. Brace yourself. This revelation is just the appetizer. Were you there through the doctor's appointment? First? Yes, Your Honor. You were? Yes, Your Honor. You signed the birth certificate. You even snuck down the stairs and signed it without my permission. You know the baby yours. Yes, I did because He I did could... what, Miss Nesbitt? I went downstairs to go get my birth certificate and his name was on there. I told him not his name on there because I had doubts from the beginning, but he snuck anyways and signed his name on there. Oh! You had asked him previously not to sign it because you had doubts yourself. Yes, Your Honor. Ms. Nesbitt drops a bombshell, admitting to a shadow of doubt over who the father really is, thanks to a one-off romantic escapade with her neighbor, Mr. Brown. This spicy encounter happened right before she discovered she was expecting. Now, Mr. Henderson's got his eyebrows raised so high, they're practically in orbit, especially since their attempts at starting a family had been fruitless for a year. What's coming up next? A witness who might just flip the whole script. You said, I'm the father. I'm responsible. I'm gonna take care of this child. Yes, Your Honor. So why are you not taking care of the child and only bought some diapers? <laughs> Baby's not mine, Your Honor. I can't be no man that's taking care of another man, baby. Okay, now I want to understand that. Your doubt. Because what it sounds like to me is you were at the hospital and you were really trying to convince yourself was a way for you to say, okay, I'm gonna stay in with this family. I'm gonna make a family. I'm gonna be here. I'm gonna sign the birth certificate. The drama reaches fever pitch. Enter Mr. Brown, called to the stand to spill the tea on his rendezvous with Ms. Nesbitt, which he cheekily labels as birthday sex. Mr. Brown is pretty confident he's not the father, arguing that the kid doesn't even share his dislike for mornings or his distinct lack of rhythm. Meanwhile, Ms. Nesbitt stands firm, insisting it was a once-in-a-lifetime slip-up, despite the texts that suggest their good morning. Exchanges weren't just about the Weether. Strap in. The bombshell revelation is just around the corner. He had sex with his cousin, and I felt very vulnerable about it, and, you know... Yes, I did, but that was before her. She, she already knew about that. You know, I received the inbox telling me she said that she had sex with my little black car and they had a baby. And I felt very astounded about it, so, you know, Miss, you know, I felt... She told you before that when you were sitting in the car with your friend? Just when you're convinced that you've seen every twist and turn possible, the moment of truth arrives. Drum roll, please. Yes, Your Honor. Did she also say I had slept with Mr. Brown? Yes, Your Honor. Oh, she but did? She told me she used a condom, Your Honor. And then not too long ago, she told me the condom broke, Your Honor. Mr. Henderson, when she told you she'd also slept with Mr. Brown, but it was just one night, did you say to yourself, I know now this could possibly be his child, or you tried to just, you, you were living in denial? I was living in denial, Your Honor. Baby looked just like you. You took practice with her. Just when you thought the drama couldn't possibly escalate, the epic saga of Casey versus Ewing, Edwards, and Hawkins kicks off. Picture this. For a quarter of a century, Ms. Casey has been living the plot twist of her life, convinced by her mom that her bio dad is the late gent on her birth certificate. Meanwhile, Mr. Edwards is out there, claiming paternity rights like he's auditioning for a soap opera. Huh? Buckle up, because this paternity puzzle is just beginning to unravel, and oh boy, it's about to get bumpy. Miss Casey, you say that for more than 25 years, your mother has told you that a deceased man who is listed on your birth certificate is your biological father. Yes, Your Honor. Now another man, Mr. Edwards, is claiming he is your biological father. Yes, Your Honor. Strap in for the emotional whirlwind, folks, as Ms. Case lays bare the soul-crushing journey of growing up fatherless, calling it a ride through the seventh circle of hell, but without the cool Dante guide. She paints a vivid picture of her quest for paternal identity, tossing us into the deep end of her emotional turmoil. I do not know what the man looks like. I don't have a picture of him. I don't have anything about him, but he is on my birth certificate. <laughs> My oldest daughter I gave, I passed Hawkins on to her. So I pretty much raised my kids the way that I have never been raised. I make sure that the mother and the father is in the home and they know exactly who their father is, whether he wants to be there or not. So Mr. Edwards steps up, all but wearing a shirt that says dad material, convinced down to his marrow that he's the missing piece in Ms. Case's family puzzle, citing his family's unmistakable nose as evidence. This chapter dives deep into the heart and sometimes the gut instincts of paternity mysteries. But wait, there's more. The surprises have barely started. She informed me then that he had been shot in the head by his brother and he was deceased. Laconda was seven years old when I was told that. I didn't want to tell her until she got older. I didn't know how to tell her. And I'm telling you exactly what I was told. And what was your relationship? relationship like? Were you all in a committed relationship? Yes, ma'am, we was until he came back from overseas. And Miss Casey, when did you hear that Mr. Edwards could possibly be your father? 
Just when you think you figured it out, boom. Otis Hawkins, who was supposedly more ghost than guest, turns out to be very much alive. This bombshell sends shockwaves through the courtroom, flipping the script and potentially cracking the case wide open. Brace yourselves. This roller coaster is about to do a loop-de-loop. -loop. So you reached out to her on social media. I was looking. You were looking. I was looking for them. I, I, I'm sorry. I am so sorry. I felt like this. We lost one. Lost one boy. <laughs> Lose this one. I'm not losing you. I'm not losing you. I don't even understand how I can tell. It's like the hair stands up on my back. She looks so much like my family. She's got everything that my mom had. In an unexpected twist of fate, Mr. Hawkins, in a scene straight out of a telenovela, reveals he's been carrying around a picture of Miss Casey for over two and a half decades, hinting at a bond that could be thicker than the plot of this whole saga. All these years, you've had Otis Hawkins on your birth certificate. Yes, Your Honor. Eventually, I had, when I got over the age of 18, me and my husband sat down and we did a research. I got on a social network. I found Otis Hawkins, and he was in Natchez, Mississippi. They did not explode if he was alive or DC. As the truth bubbles to the surface, the DNA tests are revealed. You've been told for over 25 years that Otis Hawkins, the man you believe to be your father, was dead. Yes, ma'am. But he's alive. <laughs> and we found him for you. Jerome, please escort oh my Mr. Hawkins God. into the courtroom. <laughs> you need to sit down? You okay? Let me go up to the witness. <laughs> In the grand return of Ms. Austin, as the episode kicks off, you could cut the tension with a butter knife. It was that thick. For the third blockbuster appearance in paternity court, Ms. Austin strides in, ready to face off against Mr. Wallace and Ms. Roberts in the ultimate showdown over who's the daddy of her adorable, yet legally embroiled, nine-month-old munchkin, Ronell. She's on a mission to prove that Mr. Wallace is indeed the father, and it's high time he stepped up to the plate. This juicy setup promises a roller coaster of emotions and some spicy courtroom drama. Let the games begin. Ms. Austin, this is your third time here in our courtroom with Mr. Wallace and Miss Robert. Previously, you were here because Mr. Wallace questioned the paternity of your other child, but now you find yourself in the same situation. Today, you say you need to prove to Mr. Wallace that he is the father of your nine-month-old son, Ronell, so that he can begin to step up and be a father. Just when you're sitting there, popcorn in hand, thinking things can't possibly get more dramatic, hold on to your hats, they do. Mr. Wallace, unable to keep his cool, launches into a tirade, hurling less than flattering nickname at Ms. Austin. This earns him a swift scolding from the unflappable judge leg and a one-way ticket out of the courtroom. This fiery exchange not only spices up the proceedings, but serves as a prime example of how quickly personal grievances can boil over in the hot pot that is paternity court. Things are heating up, folks. So girl, I'm not having no father in their life. She is a whore. I never had anybody to show me how to treat a woman or to be a man or just need help on. And that's why we're here. So last time you were standing on the defendant's side with Ronyel, yes, Mr. Wallace. Mr. Wallace, you back with Miss Robert. Yes, ma'am. In what can only be described as a scene straight out of a Wild West saloon, the courtroom erupts. A full-on brawl ensues between Ms. Roberts and Ms. Austin, turning the room into chaos central. Judge Lake, in a bid to restore peace in the wild lands of justice, calls for order, resulting in Ms. Roberts being escorted out. This moment of madness shines a spotlight on the fiery passions and simmering tensions that underpin this legal kerfuffle. But wait, there's more, just when you thought we'd seen it all. Since the last time we was here, everything started out okay, but we all know that wasn't gonna last long. Ryan Wallace was still bouncing back from me and Kendrick. I had enrolled in school, but I never did go because I had got pregnant once again with Ronell. And she got pregnant with her baby, with her son. And as you can see now, once again, I'm pregnant again with my third baby. As we dive deeper into this saga, the plot doesn't just thicken, it practically congeals. Mr. Wallace, harboring a truckload of doubts about baby Ronell's paternity, thanks to Ms. Austin's social calendar, goes full detective. He reveals his secret weapon, spyware, used to snoop on her texts and calls, convinced she's been playing the field. This juicy tidbit turns the case into a veritable soap opera, rife with betrayal, jealousy, and a dash of tech-savvy snooping. What's next? A paternity test sponsored by a reality TV show? Stay tuned. Mr. Wallace has been going back and forth between you two women and you two women are still falling for. Why is there a doubt then, Mr. Wallace, as to whether or not her child is your child if you've been having babies with both of these women back and forth all this time? Because she's very mischievous. Uh, when we was together, I had installed, um, it was like spyware on her phone. They would duplicate her text messages and call logs and send a copy to my email. 
Mr. Wallace. In a plot twist that no one, and I mean no one, saw coming, Mr. Wallace's frustration hits the roof and he decides he's had enough of this circus. Accusing Judge Lake of playing favorites and clearly overwhelmed by the avalanche of drama, he makes a break for it, trying to storm out of the courtroom. This bold move is a vivid flashback to his previous antics, painting him as the courtroom's resident drama king. But Judge Lake, ever the beacon of calm in the tempest, along with the mighty Jerome, steps in to de-escalate the situation. Will they manage to keep him in the courtroom? Only time will tell. I knocked a foot. Stop it! No, you won't. Ms. Wa Mr. Wallace! You sitting up here, you taking hugs Come that! Come on! You're like, you ain't even let me get a word in! Stand up! Jerome, just give him a minute. Give him a minute. Oh. Mr. Wallace, I'm glad you came back. What I was trying to tell you before you left is I don't want you to make the same mistake again. When you were just speaking to me, you said you're taking her side. I'm not gonna let you leave here thinking I'm taking anybody's side and the results are in. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Wallace, you are Ronnell's father. I wanna get you all some help.